Welcome to the Surviving Sepsis Early Management Saves Lives conference call. My name is Chris, and I will be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I will now turn the call over to Ms. Gloria Pizzo from EMPRO. Ms. Pizzo, you may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar presented by EMPRO as part of the Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network. This webinar is presented in partnership with the Grade 8, which is a collaborative of 19 quality improvement organizations across our country. I would like to introduce our speaker, Pat Poza. Pat has held various roles in healthcare in her 34 years of practice, currently serving as a faculty for the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Phase 4 Collaborative and is the national project on cusp for mechanically ventilated patients. Prior to her current role, she has held positions as a critical care staff nurse, a manager, an educator, and director of nursing and administrator of an outpatient multi-specialty primary care clinic. Pat's passion is excellence in clinical practice and has been involved in many programs with that aim, including hospital-wide sepsis management program and the statewide Keystone ICU Patient Safety Initiative, where she's a member of the advisory board. She earned her BSN from Wayne State University and her Master's of Science in Administration with a healthcare focus from Central Michigan University. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Pat. Thank you, Pat. Well, thanks, Gloria, and uh, I'm excited to be here talking with all of you. Um, as uh, Chris, the operator, said, we'll have time for questions at the end, and you can also put questions into the chat box. Um, so excited to talk about something that uh, I've uh, worked patients with sepsis since I began my career um, uh, a number of years ago. So we're going to talk about the incidence of sepsis. We're going to talk about the difference between sepsis, severe sepsis, and septic shock. We're going to focus on early recognition and, and what is the early recognition process for severe sepsis and discuss some evidence-based interventions for severe sepsis. So lots to pack into this next hour, um, but um, hopefully it will be very helpful and you guys will have the ability to get these slides um, so that you can reference them. We know sepsis has uh, plagued uh, our hospitalized patients for a long time, and we now, uh, current statistics tell us is it's the sixth most common reason for hospitalization. One out of 23 patients in the hospital has septicemia. It's the major cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide. And this is what gets me at, um, and passionate about improving and uh, sepsis care and saving lives is that just in the United States, more than 500 people die of severe sepsis every day. So that's like two planes crashing every day with no survivors. So if you think about that, wow. And we now know how to manage it well enough to significantly decrease mortality, and we're going to talk about that. But first, let's start off with a polling question. Um, do you send, and I, I know a number of you are from skilled nursing facilities or extended care facilities, so do you send your residents or patients to the hospital for infections? Um, so if you'll take a few minutes and, and the polling question it will be on the right side of your screen um, under the polling tab. And uh, um, so once you answer yes or no, um, go ahead and hit the submit button, and uh, um, someone will let me know when. Uh, okay, so the poll has ended. We wanted you to answer really fast, um, which is good, and the results should come up. Um, I would imagine that we send a lot of people from skilled nursing facilities to the hospital. Okay, so I'm not seeing the answer yet, so Gloria or Jennifer, um, you can help me out when uh, I'll keep going. Oh, there's the answer. So um, a large portion of you, um, I, we probably didn't give you enough time. I don't know if there's a way to give a little more time 
uh, for the polling question for the next one, but uh, the significant uh, portion of you are sending people to the hospital um, for infections. And one of the things that hopefully you'll get out of today's discussion is how to um, maybe not have to send them to the hospital for infections, but to be able to um, identify sepsis and infections early and treat them to where you won't need to send them. So one of the things we know about sepsis is that it, it's a time-sensitive disease. So similar to heart attack, um, similar to stroke, and similar to how we approach trauma in, in the United States, uh, those are all time-sensitive diseases, and we've been able to significantly decrease mortality for all three of these. And it's been because uh, of identifying them early and implementing evidence-based interventions in a timely fashion. And so we now have those for sepsis. And we need to ensure that we put in those evidence-based interventions. But first you have to understand um, what's the difference between an infection, sepsis, and severe sepsis. So I'm going to spend just a couple minutes doing reviewing those. So say you have a patient that has an infection. Um, we'll take an example of a patient with um, cellulitis on their right thigh. So this patient has an infection um, locally on the right thigh, and so signs that the patient is infected is you'll see redness, you'll see swelling um, and warmth to that area, and you might have drainage. What's happening physiologically um, in that local area of infection is we have increased capillary permeability, and that is causing the fluid to leak out of the intervascular space. We also have... Um, vasodilatation of the blood vessels so that um, more blood and all those healing elements can get to the infection um, and increase inflammation at the site. So that's what's occurring locally. When, my, when a patient moves from infection to sepsis, instead of having a, a local response to a local infection, they now have a systemic response to a local infection. And we'll talk about what that response looks like in a few minutes. So they have a systemic response to this local infection. How do I know my patient's having a systemic response? I look for um, two out of four criteria. Do they have a temp greater than 38 or less than 36? Do they have a heart rate greater than 90, respiratory rate greater than 20, or a white count greater than 12 or less than 4,000, or greater than a 10% immature neutrophils or bands? So if I have two of those plus an infection, now I have sepsis. So infection plus two or more SIRS equals sepsis. Um, and then the patient can continue down the continuum um, to a worsening degree um, and move into severe sepsis. And so the difference between sepsis and severe sepsis is with severe sepsis, I now have an organ dysfunctioning as a result of this sepsis process. So our patient with a cellulitis, now all of a sudden um, their urine output drops um, to less than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour for greater than two hours. Or they all of a sudden their oxygen saturation drops and now you need to supply them with O2. So what's happening is this systemic response to the infection is causing um, the inability of the tissues to receive oxygen, and as a result of that, they move from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism. They don't create enough energy for the cell, and they also create a byproduct of lactic acid. And so I don't have enough energy for the cells to function, and soon the cells and then the tissues and then the organs begin to dysfunction. And so you'll see it in the variety of organ systems. So respiratory, you would see an increase in O2 requirements, your saturation drop in the 90%. Um, cardiovascular, you're going to see a drop in blood pressure. Um, renal, a drop in your output, or you'll see a rise in your creatinine of 0.5 or more. Um, neurologically, and this is often, especially in elderly population, this is often the first thing that you'll see is an altered level of consciousness. 
um, that's unrelated to the primary neural pathology. So subtle confusion, uh, forgetfulness. Um, uh, hopefully, uh, you'll catch it before they um, become unconscious. And then metabolically, we're looking for an unexplained metabolic acidosis. And so a lactate greater than 4 is pretty severe. Any lactate greater than 2 would be considered a metabolic dysfunction and um, considered an organ dysfunction. So what we know now and what we've actually known since Sir William Osler in 1904 shared with us that except on a few occasions, the patient appears to die from the body's response to the infection rather than from the infection itself, um, which is significant. And, and what we've been trying for the last 50 years is how do we prevent that body from over-responding because that's where the organ failure and the ultimate death is often caused from. So uh, what happens in severe sepsis? Uh, we have too much coagulation going on, not enough, or too much inflammation, and not enough fibrinolysis. So we make a lot of little clots, and they clot off the um, the capillaries, and we don't get enough oxygen to the tissue. At the same time, we're not uh, breaking down those clots. So this is a schematic of uh, the endothelial membrane, which lines your blood vessels. And this is the target organ for this uh, over-response. And so you see the bugs come in, and the body responds by sending neutrophils and monocytes. And uh, those neutrophils cause the release of a bunch of cytokines that cause that inflammatory response, cause the vasodilatation, and now it's not just happening locally but systemically, and they also cause increased capillary permeability. Together, the monocytes and the neutrophils cause the release of tissue factor that ignites the coagulation cascade, and now we're making all these little clots. And at the same time, we're not... Um, we're not breaking down the clots like normally we do because fibrinolysis is suppressed. So then what happens is here's a picture of what the microcirculation, so at the capillary level, should look like. Um, on this right side, you have a big venule. Um, and uh, on the, so this is the venule on the right side. And on the left side here, you have um, the... Those are the uh, small arterioles with the capillaries right here. And so that's, this is good circulation. We have good gas exchange. Um, but now let's look at um, the septic patient. This is someone who's in septic shock and on a vasopressor. And you can see the difference here. I don't see nice capillary loops. I don't see good circulation. Um, I see a bunch of microemboli that are prevent, uh, clotting off the capillaries. And so I'm not getting oxygen to the tissues, and that results in um, increased lactic acid production because we move to anaerobic metabolism. It also results in um, organ dysfunction. So how do we manage this awful disease? Well, first and foremost, we have to work on prevention, and we're going to talk a few minutes on prevention, but then there's some PIGL research that was done here in Michigan um, at Henry Ford Hospital where they identified uh, a significant impact in mortality when early, when these patients were recognized early in the ED process and uh, provided fluids and getting lactate and then resuscitated to certain goals in a quick time frame. And those early interventions proved uh, um, significant, and we, for the first time, saw a significant reduction in mortality for this population. So early intervention is important um, to identify these patients, early identification and screening, and we're going to talk about that, and then intervening um, with controlling the source of the infection by providing antibiotics or if you need a surgical removal of the source, getting blood cultures, and then implementing evidence-based practices, the initial resuscitation bundle and the septic shock bundle. 
So let's talk a little bit about each of those. We're going to talk about prevention first, and I know this is something that we're all worried about. Um, the first piece of prevention, of course, is hand washing, and I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't talk about it, and it's important. Um, the, uh, the five moments of hand hygiene before patient contact, before a septic task, after body fluid exposure, um, after patient contact, and after contact with the patient's surroundings. Very important. You can't reinforce this enough. Um, this is a key to uh, infection prevention. And I know over the years uh, in the hospital world, we've really worked on decreasing infections from devices. So, um, Class C central line associated bloodstream infection and CAUTI um, catheter associated urinary tract infections. And so, we've done a good job at reducing um, these infections. Uh, I would encourage you to look to see if your processes to reduce and prevent these infections are adequate. Um, for central lines, are you changing them correctly um, in a sterile fashion, and are you trying to get any central line out as quick as possible? Um, for catheter-associated UTIs, are you not using catheters when they're not indicated? And uh, when they are in, are you asking every day if they can come out, and are you ensuring that you're caring for them correctly there? Anchored, um, you do daily uh, washing um, of the meatus. Um, you make sure that there's uh, quick, good flow of the urine to the bag and that the bag doesn't sit on the floor and that it gets emptied uh, when it's greater than a, a quarter to a half full. Um, so we've been doing well in, in a recent study, um, actually it's published a year ago now, they did a point prevalence study of infections in the hospital, and the device-related infections used to be number one and two, um, and now they, together, the class C, the CAUTI, and the, the ventilator-associated pneumonia only account for um, about a quarter of all the hospitalized patients' infections. Uh, one of the areas that um, needs to be in focus for people is non-ventilated pneumonia, hospital-acquired pneumonia or healthcare-associated pneumonia. And this is something that has not been a focus in the past, but um, in that study of prevalence, um, this was number two behind surgical site infections. So it's a significant uh, um, infection, and we need to begin to um, worry about how to prevent it. And in our non-ventilated, we have a whole host of things that we do for our ventilated patients to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia. We need to craft that same uh, or a similar list for our non-ventilated patients to prevent pneumonia, and they'll include, uh, you know, head of the bed, uh, good oral, oral hygiene and mouth care as well as uh, mobility and good nutrition, and then coughing and deep breathing. So those are things that if it's not on your hit list of areas to focus on, that I would encourage you to do so. Now, probably one of the biggest pieces that we can do um, to increase survival for patients that get infections and to prevent them from moving down that sepsis continuum we talked about is screening and early identification. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Um, first, we're going to do a polling question, and, if there, and I know that if we can extend the time limit to a minute, but it might just be through. Oh, we did. So um, you've got a minute to answer this question. Do you have a screening process to identify patients with severe sepsis in your organization? Um, so the answer is yes, no, or we're putting one in place. So um, please answer that. That would be great. So here's an example of a screening tool. This is the tool we use at our organization. Um, this was an early version of our tool, and I include it for a specific reason related to the bottom of, this, uh, of the page. So in this screening tool, um, it's 
a three-step process. The nursing staff, upon admission, and um, at every shift, they are going to look to see if the patient has um, the systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So do they have the temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, like blood cell count, um, or a blood glucose greater than 140 in um, a non-diabetic patient? So if I answer no to them, and I don't have, I only have one, or I have none, then that's a negative screen for severe sepsis and uh, the nurse initials there. If they're checking two or more, then they move on to question two, which is, does this patient have a known or suspected infection? And um, one of the surrogates for a known or suspected infection is that they're being provided antibiotic therapy. So if I answer yes to this, as well as have answered yes to the two thirds, now I move on to question three. So if I answer yes to one, meaning I have two or more thirds, and I answer yes to two, I have a known or suspected infection, now I have sepsis, and we're going to look to see if they have new organ dysfunction, and that would then put them into severe sepsis. So we're going to look through all the organ systems, and if I checked one of these, now my patient has screened positive for severe sepsis, and we need to contact the physician, um, and there needs to be some blood work obtained, and if the patient's hypertensive, given a fluid bolus. And we created this SBAR script um, for that call, and so this was a tool we used um, in from 2007 to 2007. Um, 10 or 11, and then we've switched it since then, and, and the fluid bolus parameter has in, increased to 30 milliliters per kilogram. But this was a great way to give, um, have the nursing staff call the physician with specifics. The patient screened positive for severe sepsis. Um, this is how they screen positive. Any other assessment in values or information that you want to share with the physician, but most important is this recommendation. I need you to come and evaluate this patient. Um, while you're on your way, can I get the following labs, and are there any other labs that you would like, and if the patient's hypotensive, can I begin a fluid bolus? So a very important tool as part of our process to early identify these patients. So I have the results to the poll. Um, and it looks like about a third of you have screening processes in place, and I commend you um, and uh, because that's the first step in being able to identify this population early to impact mortality. So we've adapted it as the guidelines have adapted, and um, here's an example. We also have... Uh, in our organization, we place them in a different level of care based on how they screened, uh, if they screened positive and what their lactate was and what their blood pressure was. We also have instituted, if they're not going to the ICU, um, bundles of intervention that we expect the nursing staff to do um, in conjunction with the physician to monitor these patients. If they're screening positive for severe sepsis, we increase Besides getting the blood cultures, getting the physician to get antibiotics ordered, um, uh, vital si we've increased the vital signs, and we are monitoring their intake and output closely so that we can uh, look for that new organ dysfunction. Um, and the only difference in the intermediate and the general care is the frequency of the vital signs because that patient has been hypotensive before or they have a very high lactate. So in working with a, a group in uh, southeastern Michigan, uh, we, uh, they took some of the tools that uh, we had put in place and uh, adapted them for an extended care facility. Uh, myself and other clinicians have been working with um, some extended care facilities to help them put in screening processes. And so this is a tool that um, these facilities are beginning to use. Um, they're going to look for the infection first, 
and you can see here um, if the patient has an infection, they want them to check their glucose because they want to look for uh, an elevated glucose in the non-diabetic patient. Um, and so if I have a known or suspected infection or I'm on antibiotic therapy, I move to Section 2. Um, and there's uh, a nice arrow here to tell you that you need to move um, and uh, nice pictures to um, give it a little uh, zazz in color. Um, and if I check two of the SIRS, um, my patient's screen positive and I need the patient uh, to be placed on INO and order a lactate and then look for organ dysfunction. So again, it's uh, about going through that those three steps, looking to see where the patient is on the sepsis continuum. Do they just have an infection or do they have an infection in two thirds now they have sepsis? Or do they have an infection two thirds and now have also have organ dysfunction and they're in severe sepsis? And then we put in a um, SBAR script to talk to the physician with. Um, in places uh, where we hope to extend this and some additional tools have, are, have been created is as you're putting this process into your um, extended care facility, one of the things we wanted to be able to do was to link with your current processes. So, for example, I know in skilled nursing facilities, a lot of places have the stop and watch interact. And so, um, as in the hospital, the frequency of sepsis screening is we do it on admission, we do it every shift, and then we also do it with a condition change. Here would be, um, I would encourage you to do it um, at least once a day, um, and maybe it's more frequent during the first few days of a patient's admission, um, or do it on anyone that's on an antibiotic, but then also link it with your interact process so, so that if some, someone, a, a resident or a patient triggers the stop and watch when the CNA is telling the nurse about that, that the nurse would then screen. And then this top portion um, is some information to provide to the patients um, or if you're a home care agency um, and uh, you're um, wanting to educate the patients about uh, what to look for to identify sepsis, um, this is a good tool. Um, look, watch for skin redness, listen for complaints of pain, chills, or breathing, um, is your wound warm, your pulse fast, do you have an odor, decreased appetite, so early warning signs to then talk to a provider. The uh, Surviving Sepsis Campaign was formulated and put together in um, 2002, 2003, and it's a worldwide organization to improve the management of patients with sepsis. And um, they put together um, evidence-based guidelines, and they put those guidelines into bundles. And uh, that those bundles were published initially in 2004, been updated in 2008, 2012, and, and just had a recent update to one of the bundles um, this past month. So it's in the hospital world, Starting in October, it's going to be a core measure. Um, so that's why you can see here NQF, the National Quality Forum, and the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. These are the bundles. So there's a three-hour bundle, and this is um, exactly what it states, that these interventions need to be completed in three hours. Um, so if you have a patient that screens positive for severe sepsis, um, you need to measure the lactate, obtain blood cultures, administer broad-spectrum antibiotics, and then if they're hypotensive or their lactate is greater than or equal to 4, administer a 30 milliliter per kilogram fluid bolus. Now, you in the non-hospital area, you guys are not going to be um, included in this measurement um, requirement. It's going to be an inpatient measurement, but if it's an inpatient measurement, it, it can be extended 
um, in years to come. But the this first three-hour bundle are all interventions that can be done um, in an extended care facility and some even in a home. Um, again, the, it depends on the level of uh, IV access, et cetera, um, that you're able to provide in your facility or in the home. The organizations that we're working with here in southeastern Michigan um, have committed to um, providing this three-hour bundle when they identify patients in severe sepsis. And um, with the hopes of being able to avoid sending that patient back to the hospital for an, um, an ER visit and most likely an admission. And uh, so we're pretty early on in the process, um, uh, but we've heard anecdotally from the facilities that have put this process in place, we have four now, that they're um, seeing significant reductions in um, sending residents or patients um, needing to send residents or patients to the hospital. Now, it doesn't mean that you never send them to the hospital because it, if you provide these interventions on the three-hour bundle and your patient is still hypotensive, then that patient needs to come to the hospital and in the hospital they'll probably be placed in, in the intensive care unit and additional interventions will be provided. And these are the interventions that are, will be provided um, in the ER and then in um, in the ICU, applying vasopressors and then continuing resuscitation and remeasuring the lactate. So I want to quickly go over a case study just so as you've been listening, um, how uh, we're going to take care of this patient together. Um, she's an 88-year-old and she weighs 52 kilos. Um, and she's um, currently residing in an ECF, and her um, she has a history of CAP, COPD, dementia, Alzheimer's disease, depression, SVT. She has, her chief complaint is rib pain, chest congestion, and shortness of breath. She's awakened and, lor and oriented, is slightly combative, and she's had a history of combative behavior. So if you remember our screening process, um, we've taken some vital signs here. Um, would you say this patient screens positive for severe sepsis? Now, I don't have a poll up, um, so we're just going to do this virtually. So in your mind, um, do you think she screens positive for severe sepsis? Well, let's walk through that screening tool. The first piece is, does she have a known or suspected infection? Um, so in looking at her chief complaint, what her issues are, um, she's telling us she has rib pain, chest congestion, and shortness of breath. So we would want to potentially suspect a respiratory process, so potent, uh, suspected respiratory or pneumonia. Does she have two or more of the systemic inflammatory response syndrome? So if you remember, those are the temps greater than uh, 38, which is greater than uh, 101. And so, yes, her temp is 101.6. It's a respiratory rate greater than 20, and hers is 31. And then it's a heart rate greater than 90, and hers is 109. Even though it's atrial fib, it, she probably is usually in a controlled rate, and so the high rate is one of those signs of SIRS. So she has three out of the four SIRS. Now, we don't have a white blood cell count yet, and so we don't know if she'll have four out of the four, and we don't have a blood glucose. So she now has a suspected infection and two or more SIRS, so she has sepsis. So let's look to see if she has organ dysfunction. So she is on two liters of oxygen, one of the caveats of organ dysfunction is that organ dysfunction needs to be in an organ system that's not the organ system that's infected. Um, so, for example, with her, we think she has an pneumonia. Now, we have to do a test history to prove that, but 
her need for O2 is probably related to the local infection impacting her lungs and not the systemic response that is causing the microcirculation to have lots of uh, microemboli and not get enough oxygen to the tissues. So this need for O2 would not put her into severe sepsis um, with her presentation of rule out pneumonia. But she does have another organ dysfunction, and that's her blood pressure. She, her blood pressure systolic is less than 90. So would we answer, does she screen positive for severe sepsis? Hopefully you're all shaking your head say, and saying to your uh, muted phones, yes. Um, so yes, she does. So what are we going to do? Well, the beauty of that screening form is that um, you put the what to do next right there on the form. So what do we need to do next? Well, we probably need to get some labs. We need to call the doc, um, and we need to give some fluid And because she's hypotensive. You, um, you could start off with a 20 milliliter per kilogram fluid bolus, but our goal would be a 30 milliliter per kilogram fluid bolus. And we want to get a lactate CDG, uh, complete blood count. And you can either, because of respiratory concerns, you can get an arterial blood gas um, or a venous blood gas. Now, that's not, um, if you don't normally draw blood gases at your facility, you can probably get away with it, as long as she's not in respiratory distress, not getting one. So we've just gone through our tool, right? Um, she has a suspected pneumonia. She has the temperature, the heart rate, and the respiratory rate. Um, and she, her organ dysfunctions were respiratory, but that's where her infection is. Um, so we're not going to count that, but we are counting the fact that her blood pressure is less than 90. So we're calling the physician, and we're getting blood cultures, CBC, lactate, um, IV antibiotics, and um, we're giving her a fluid bolus. And so what you need to assess in your organization is, are you ready to put in place early recognition of um, sepsis at your facility? Is your staff knowledgeable about the importance of early recognition and management of sepsis? Um, do you have a sepsis screening process? Do not reinvent the wheel. Um, we've talked about a screening process here. Um, we've provided you with a tool. Please feel free to use that tool. And then in defining your screening process, um, are you going to do it on a regular basis? And again, the recommendations would be um, for those patients coming from the hospital that you would be doing it every shift or at least once a day. Yeah, upon admission plus every shift or once a day. And that you would also um, link it with your interact process. Um, and that if the stop and watch uh, occurs, that you would screen. And that you would be screening all patients that are on antibiotics. Um, so, I would encourage you to um, put together a process um, to set up an early, early identification program. And so here on this slide are the steps that you should take in putting this process together. First of all, you want to get a team together. And so you need to have your medical staff on board. Um, so your medical director should be part of that group, um, your infection person, as well as uh, um, key nursing individuals, your DON, or um, depending on your size, um, managers of specific units. Then develop your screening tool. And like I said, you're welcome to use this tool and just make it your own. But then define your process. So who's going to screen? When are you going to screen? Are you going to screen on paper? Or do you have an EMR that you're going to put it in? And if you're going to screen on paper, who does it, when are you going to do it, um, where are you going to keep the forms, et cetera. Got to get your medical staff support. And, um, and then you also want to um, develop an educational plan, um, educating people on sepsis as well as on um, the screening process that you're putting in place. Um, you can use this. PowerPoint to educate on sepsis, um, you're welcome to, to use it and, uh, um, and then use, create your own forms or adapt the ones that we've shared with you 
um, for screening. And then you want to evaluate, set up, how are you going to know that your new process is working? So one of the potential outcome metrics would be um, sending less patients to the ED or less patients getting readmitted for sepsis um, to a hospital. And your process metrics might be, okay, I'm supposed to screen every day, or if the patient's on antibiotics, um, I need to screen them every shift. Uh, whatever your process that you're establishing, then you need to, to audit whether or not that's happening. And so are we screening when we've defined the screening time and frequency? And then if we screen positive, are we doing the appropriate next step? Calling the doctor, getting the appropriate um, antibiotic orders, blood cultures, lactate, and fluid. So that's sepsis. That's the uh, importance. Hopefully I've been able to share with you the importance of, of early identification of patients with sepsis and the importance of putting in a standardized process. Just providing your staff with education on what is sepsis is important, but that's not enough because they'll forget about it, um, you know, two weeks after the educational material. And it's not because the education is not good. That's just how much we, how easy it is to lose and not retain information. So you have to create a process in your organization that this just becomes part of what you do. So um, I'd be happy to um, ascertain questions. I don't know. If, I know we have quite a few participants, so um, we want people to put it into the chat. Um, and I'm looking at the chat right now. We are a critical access hospital and therefore did not answer question one because um, NA was not an option. My audio and outlook connection were early cutting out. Oh, that anyone had, sorry, we, uh, I didn't deal with the uh, someone having audio problems. Um, so, Hi, Pat. Have, yep. This is Gloria. We can open it up for Q&As now. Um, but we have one question here regarding um, the core measure metrics for sepsis. Could you um, give some uh, information and some highlights on uh, data collection that's beginning in the qu quarter four of 2015 and some of the challenges for that and maybe discuss some of the core measures um, between sepsis and um, sepsis shock? Yeah, so the core measures are going to be um, the bundles, and so I'll um, – so the CMS is, uh, has designated sepsis management as one of the core measures that data collection will begin in October of 2015. They haven't come out with what the expectations are for compliance. They have not shared with us yet um, when it would be tied to reimbursement. So we don't know those details. They, um, you can find on the CMS website under hospital metrics, um, hospital indicators, the 62-page core measure for sepsis definition. Um, that you'll be sampling um, patients in the hospital, um, and uh, they give you a, some examples of sampling methodology. But the items that you'll that we are measuring is if a lactate is obtained, um, blood cultures prior to antibiotic administration, administering broad-spectrum antibiotics, and then giving a 30 milliliter per kilogram fluid bolus for someone who is hypotensive, systolic less than 90, or has a lactate greater than it equal to 4. In the hospital, the time of presentation is, and so time zero where the clock starts, is in the emergency department, it's time of triage. Um, if they develop it in the hospital, it's um, when the chart annotation consists of all the elements of severe sepsis or septic shock. So all four of these measures um, will be part of the core measures, 
and then um, they will measure if vasopressors are being applied. Um, number six is changing. It won't just be CDP and SCVO2. It, uh, you'll get a choice of uh, a physician doing a physical exam between hours three and six and a specific um, documentation post that exam to identify if the patient is uh, adequately resuscitated or you can pick two out of the four of uh, the following. You can measure your CVP, measure an SCVO2, um, do a uh, measure a dynamic response to fluid um, through passive leg raise or a fluid bolus. And the fourth one is echo looking at IBC diameter. And then um, the final measure is remeasuring lactate. So each of the components of the bundle are part of the core measures. Thank you, Pat. Um, operator, could you please open up our line for Q&A? Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you have questions, please press star then one from your touchtone phone. If you wish to be removed from the queue, please press the pound sign or the hash key. If you are using a speakerphone, you may need to pick up the handset first before pressing the numbers. Once again, if you have a question, please press star then one from your touchtone phone. Standing by for questions. So, um, be before we take that first question, I can answer some questions in the chat. Um, the NQF bundles indicate antibiotics within an hour of identification of severe sepsis. Um, will the core measure antibiotic be in three hours, or is it one hour? So um, the core measure will be three hours. Um, what the literature tells us is that you want to, um, the best practice for our patients is to get the antibiotic within an hour um, to have that first one hung um, to decrease, uh, to improve survival. Every hour you delay, um, decreases survival by 7.6% per hour. But the NQF and CMS is just going to look that um, the antibiotic has been provided within three hours. So um, it's the three-hour number. Um, do we have any other questions? And we have Barbara online with a question. Barbara, please go ahead. Um, yes, thank you. Excellent presentation. And actually, you just answered my one question. But I just, <coughs> excuse me, thought of another question. You said that time zero will be from the triage time. So from the triage time is when all the measures will start, even though in some patients, um, like say a patient on a beta blocker with maybe a poor autoimmune response, they could present with a surge of zero or one over four, and yet truly be severely septic, and that might not be identified till a little later time point when you have labs available. Will their triage time zero still be from the triage time? Um, yes. So that, that has been um, a big debate, uh, and um, CMS, when they do a core measure, want to ensure that they have a reliable time zero that's reproducible, and they understand that um, probably patients that have severe sepsis or septic shock in the ER, probably only about 60 or 70 percent of them present that way, and the others w aren't recognized till later on in the process after labs get back, et cetera. Um, they recognize that, but they still are committed that triage time will also um, ensure that we do our best as organizations to identify these patients early. Right. Okay, and, thank you. Yes. There was a question in there was a question in the chat. I had given an example that had twenty milliliters per kilogram fluid bolus, but the um, and that was from a um, patient in, in when we were doing the guidelines before it was switched to 30. Core measure will be 30 milliliters per kilogram. Go ahead. And we have Kathy online with a question. Kathy, please go ahead. And Kathy, if you're on mute, please unmute yourself. I will be releasing you back in the call. 
We do have Barbara online with a follow-up question. Barbara, please go ahead. Um, yes. Another question is, who do you expect to be excluded from the core measures? Would patients on end-stage renal disease, on hemodialysis, or your stage 4 cancer patients, do they anticipate any exclusions for these patients? So those exclusions are spelled out. Um, I don't uh, remember all of them off the top of my head. I know that a patient into hospice or comfort care within so many hours of admission will be excluded. Uh, I don't think end-stage renal disease patients will be excluded. Um, and, but So all of those exclusion criteria have been called out, and they are on that 62-page document. Thank you. Once again, if you have a question, please press star then one from your touch tone phone. So there, while we're waiting for any other questions, um, just a couple other questions that came in the chat. Um, will the core measure sample population be based upon ICD-9 or DRG? I think that uh, they're going to allow the um, – they gave some sampling strategies on how to find your patients. You can find them prospectively or you can use coded data. And um, so I think the recommendation is uh, in – I don't know what it would be in ICD-9-10 world, but in ICD-9 ICD world, it's the code of severe sepsis, which is 991.92, and septic shock, which is 785.52. Um, is procalcitonin levels useful? Um, is another question in the chat. And uh, procalcitonin levels are, are currently not a recommended part of the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines. I know that a number of organizations are using them. Uh, the literature is strongest in using procalcitonin levels to be able to uh, de-escalate your antibiotics. And that's where the um, studies have uh, proven effective. We're still trying to figure out its usefulness in, um, in septic shock. There was just a study published that I haven't read um, in the uh, Blue Journal, which is out of the American Th uh, Thoracic Society. And um, they it, it talked about use of procalcitonin when you have undifferentiated sepsis or not sure the source. You can't find a source. And that's actually how we're using, we just began using procalcitonin for that population. Um, do sepsis core measures include CBP and SCDO2 measurement? Um, yes, those will be two options. In the shock bundle, you can either have a focused exam by the physician um, or two out uh, of four. Um, and CBP and SCDO2 would be considered two. The other two are uh, echo um, and dynamic fluid responsiveness through passive leg raise or a fluid bullet. So the CMN, CMS metrics are definitely finalized now. They had been on hold for a, a while. Um, another question in the chat, are all patients screened on a regular basis? If so, including PEDS, surgical patients. So at our organization, um, we aren't screening our PEDS, but we have a very small pediatric population. We screen upon admission every shift and then uh, with a change in a condition. And then we also have an alerting process where our EMR is continually screening and will alert us to a change, and then we will screen the patient. Um, and surgical patients are included in this. Um, in the specs for severe sepsis, it mentions organ dysfunction at evidence by any of the following, creatinine greater than two. Um, so, in the original guidelines, it was a change from baseline, and so it looks like they tried to make it simpler with saying creatinine uh, greater than 2. Um, shouldn't we include only acute organ dysfunction? Um, so I have not – a lot of people are trying to digest the CMS uh, specifications. They just came out last week, um, and so there will be lots of discussion um, and that should be one of the questions. Shouldn't we only include acute organ dysfunction? The same with lactate for liver patients. 
Um, you can have a normal lactate in a, in a liver failure patient, but once that lactate rises, it's not going to clear very well, um, and so those are all good questions. Um, Many providers are hesitant to bolus congestive heart failure patients with more than 250 or 500 cc's. What are your thoughts? Um, so that's a challenge no matter what setting you're in. And um, it, in our organization, uh, we've worked with cardiology to help um, support this. Those patients um, probably, if they have known heart failure, so active treatment for heart failure, or an ejection fraction of less than 35%, they still probably need the fluid because that pathophysiology is going uh, with the vasodilatation and the leaky capillaries. But you'll want to give it to them in smaller increments like 250, but not 250 over an hour. 250 over a half hour, reassess the patient, see how they're doing, listen to their lungs, have, do they have increased O2 demands? If not, then give another 250 because um, they still need that 30 milliliters per kilogram um, in most cases, but you're going to need to do it um, slower. And I don't know if um, CMS has uh, accounted for that and has excluded um, that patient population related to the fluid bullet. Um, so I will try and find – I have that 62-page document. I'll send it to – uh, Gloria, and then she can uh, send it out to um, uh, all the people that attended today. Um, so, any other questions in the queue? And I know we're past the time. Uh, yes, we have a question from Sean. Sean, please go ahead. I just wondered, Pat, I think you touched on this just briefly about the cardiovascular ultrasound as part of the six-hour bundle. Are they talking about a limited cardiac show, or are they talking about what specifically? Yeah, so they're talking about a, a, a limited cardiac echo. Um, a lot of ICUs have portable echoes in their uh, facilities. Uh, I know we do where um, an uh, intensivist is trained to be able to just get some small diameters you know, the, the IVC diameter is what they're typically going to look for, whether or not that's collapsed or not. Um, so it's a, uh, definitely not a full echo. Um, I think just looking at um, IVC would be sufficient enough. And somebody put into the chat, um, so thank you for that, that CMS core measures are going to allow any physician documentation to contraindicate the 30 milliliter per kilogram volume for hypotension. So, again, the challenge there will be to have the physician document that it's contraindicated um, so that you'll be able to um, consider being met on that measure. So did that answer your question? And she is now offline. Okay. We have Anne oh. online with a question. Oh, hi. My question's been answered. Thank you. Well, thank you, Pat. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm going to have to get off. Uh, okay. Thank you, Pat, so much. Your, your presentation, as I already know, was riveting and engaging, as uh, evidenced by the many questions that have come in through chat or online. I appreciate your um, expertise in sharing with us um, on surviving sepsis and early management uh, please take a moment, if you're still on, um, to fill, um, fill out the evaluation for today. Thank you for your participation. Um, I would like to just mention that we will ensure that all of the participants have access to the PowerPoint presentation, um, to the early sepsis screening document, and the recording for today's webinar. Um, so stay tuned. You can also go to the LS Quinn dot org website where most of this material will be posted within the next week or two. Thank you so much, Pat. Okay, thanks everyone and go out and find those sepsis patients and identify them early. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.